Relays, we're covering today's top boxing news. Raven Chapman versus Jorgelina Guanini. Let's talk about the fight. This is a fight that worked out exactly as I predicted. More or less exactly as I expected. Raven being... Raven Chapman being a little longer than Jorgelina Guanini. A little taller. And a little faster. That in and of itself would create a lot of problems for the otherwise come forward aggressive Jorgelina Guanini. Who missed a lot of shots in this fight. Missed a lot of punches. Raven Chapman, in her fashion, got off to a very fast start. It was a bit hard to separate them in the first. But by the second round... Raven was really putting it on Jorgelina Guanini. Pouring it on. The second round. The fourth round. Punishing rounds for the veteran fighter and former champion who struggled to find her distance here, struggled to find her range. Raven Chapman is a very tricky fighter. Fast hands and fast feet, very elusive, constantly changing levels throughout the course of a fight, making herself a hard target, hard to land a clean punch on her, a meaty punch. Between her being the taller, somewhat longer fighter, and Raven's movement constantly moving in and out of striking distance, bouncing in and out of range whilst changing levels, she's a hard target. She's hard to hit clean, whereas Raven... Raven snapped Jorgelina's head back a couple of times, got off some meaty punches, nice eye-catching shots. Straight punches from the outside, short hooks mid-range to inside. It really says a lot that Raven Chapman ahead of this fight only had three professional contests, three professional bouts, a former GB alum. Not all unbeaten fighters are created equal. Not all unbeaten fighters have the same ceiling. And Raven Chapman, she showed her quality, showed what she can do against the former champion, a season veteran who is otherwise a handful. Yeah, Guanini's a handful. Most of the time she is for a lot of other fighters, but Raven kept control. Kept control of the situation, multitasking, bouncing in and out of range while changing levels and landing punches. Better on the inside, better on the outside, better in the exchange, better on the fly. Better all around. Raven Chapman was effectively able to keep a lid on the situation against an otherwise come forward fighter with a lot of toughness and a lot of experience that can be a handful, but not for Raven. She kept control of everything, kept control of the situation. Taking on a former champion in what was only her fourth professional fight. It's a statement. It says a lot about Raven's pedigree, what kind of pedigree she comes from, and what kind of ceiling she's got, what kind of fighter she is. On to bigger and better things for Raven Chapman, who secured the W, secured the decision. I figured Raven's heavy-handed and fast, but Jorgelina, she's a tough nut to crack. She's lost one or two fights, but she's never been stopped. Didn't figure she'd get stopped here, but I did figure she would lose a decision. I'm telling you, Raven Chapman, she's really something. Banting to a professional record of four wins, no losses, and no draws. This was one of two featherweight contests on the undercard of Joe Joyce versus Joseph Parker. The other being the title fight, the unification match between Amandia Serrano and then unbeaten IBF champion of Denmark. Sarah Mafood. Sarah Mafood, who didn't win a round on my card. This was a lopsided affair. This, for the most part, was one-way traffic, though there's a moral victory in there for Sarah Mafood that she was actually able to go the distance with one of the biggest punchers, biggest pound-for-pound -pound punchers in the entire sport of women's boxing. I didn't figure that Sarah Mafood would hear the final bell, but she did. You know why that is? It's because she spent the whole fight turning Amanda. Sarah Mafood, under normal circumstances, shows a little bit more spite, a little bit more aggression, shoots the one-two and steps in into it to close the gap on her opponent, whereas in this fight, she was moving away from the action, away from Amanda Serrano's... That's why she was able to go the distance. She was moving away from Amanda Serrano's power shots. Thereby taking some of the power off them, as opposed to coming forward and taking those shots flush. Amanda Serrano marched forward, walking through Sarah Mafood's jabs in her right hands. There just wasn't that much on them, and we knew that much ahead of the fight. The bigger puncher here is Amanda Serrano by far and wide. Sarah's not going to be able to keep her off, and she didn't. The most she was able to do was buy herself time. Buy herself time by moving away from the action and shooting those counters. Not that Sarah didn't land anything. She did. It's that whatever Sarah landed had no effect on Amanda Serrano. She was never discouraged, never deterred kept marching forward, walking through Sarah Mafood's best. We found out early on that perhaps it wasn't Sarah Mafood's intention to try and take Amanda Serrano out. She certainly couldn't match her power. Perhaps it was just her intention to survive. As Amanda Serrano marched forward, landing straight shots upstairs, couple of body shots, one or two at a time downstairs, she wasn't really able to unload and pour it on Sarah Mafood's body as Sarah
Sarah Mahfoud wasn't making herself available for those punches. She was constantly moving, constantly on the fly, showing good cardio and a good chin. Whenever Amanda Serrano did land clean, for what it's worth, Sarah took the punch as well. But it's because of what I told you. Sarah wasn't committing to any of her own shots. She wasn't stepping into her jab coming forward to where if she gets hit with a counter shot, there's going to be a lot on it. Quite the opposite. She was moving away from the action and away from the punches as to take something off of them at the tail end of the shot. Which was probably the smartest thing she could do in this situation because if she spent more time in the pocket with Amanda, Amanda likely would have stopped her. Monotonous from round one to round ten. It was more of the same throughout. One-way traffic, really. Three years, Sarah touched Amanda with a couple of shots, but there was nothing on those punches. Each round was more or less identical to the last, all the way up until the finish, where Amanda Serrano won a lopsided decision. I think Sarah Mahfoud, she made the same decision that Yemi Mercado made when she took on Amanda Serrano. You know, Yemi, she's normally a mid-range to inside fighter, but she knew she ain't got the firepower to go blow for blow with Amanda, so she decided to survive. That's what Sarah did. I was expecting a knockout that didn't happen, but I won't begrudge Amanda for that. When you're fighting a fighter that starts the fight off in survival mode, and they're not really engaging, it does make it that much more difficult to get off those power shots and really do damage, get the knockout. It's hard to pin an opponent down that's quite content surviving the round, but doing absolutely nothing to win it. That's what Sarah did, and there is a moral victory in there. If that's any consolation. But Amanda won the fight. It's not even close, not hard to score, monotonous at times, repetitive. Amanda Serrano is just one belt away from becoming this division's undisputed champion. And hopefully, Erica Cruz will offer up more resistance for Amanda. Give her something to have to work around. More of that than Sarah Mahfoud did. Congratulations to Amanda Serrano. We then come to the main event of that same card, the heavyweight WBO interim title fight between Joe Joyce and former champion Joseph Parker. And the fight went as I predicted. It went as I expected. I want to say Joseph Parker, he just had the wrong game plan for this fight. He really did. He almost immediately started giving up ground and giving up real estate, trying to stay on the outside of Joe Joyce's punches, which is not the right move for the smaller, stumpier fighter, Joe... Joe Joyce has got long arms. You trying to stay on the outside puts you within range of them. You're a sitting duck out there, and that's what Joseph Parker was throughout the course of this fight. Joseph Parker doesn't have the length or the height to comfortably box from the outside against the physically imposing Joe Joyce, but that's what he tried to do. That's what he did. He tried to stay on the outside of Joe Joyce, which didn't work out. It's the wrong game plan for the smaller, shorter, stumpier fighter. You gotta come forward on this guy, of anything. I don't really know what Andy Lee and Joseph Parker were thinking. Maybe it was their plan to try to walk Joe Joyce into a counter shot, maybe a counter left where Joe slips the jab, slips and hooks, or maybe he throws a overhand right over the top, a bomb. Because he started off the fight giving up ground to Joe Joyce. He started off the fight backing up. So it clearly wasn't Joseph Parker's intention to invade the pocket and crowd Joe Joyce, try to smother him, which I think would have been a better strategy for the shorter, smaller, stumpier fighter. Come forward on the guy, slip under the straight shots, and get in this guy's wheelhouse where it's harder for him to get off punches because he's got longer arms than you do. Mid-range to inside, the shorter fighter tends to have the advantage. Joseph Parker didn't employ that strategy. He seemed to have wanted to stay on the outside of Joe Joyce. And I don't know, maybe it was because he was looking to walk him into a big shot, a big punch, or maybe it's just that he didn't want to trade blows with Joe Joyce. He didn't want to exchange didn't want to trade. When there's a height differential like this one, to where one guy is clearly a lot bigger than the other, what you normally see is the shorter fighter trying to invade the pocket and crowd the taller fighter as to smother his work, make it difficult for him to get off big punches, big shots. This kind of goes back to what I said ahead of the fight, that Joseph Parker lacks spite, lacks the dog. This ain't got no dog in him. And you'd need some dog in you for a fight like this, because if you don't know nothing else, you know that Joe Joyce is going to come forward. You know he's going to look to overwhelm you. You know what this guy's going to do. I mean, you at least know that 
ahead of time. It's all a question of how do you plan to deal with it? Joseph Parker chose a passive aggressive approach instead of taking the initiative and coming forward on Joe. It was the most punishment I've ever seen Joseph Parker take in a fight. More than what we saw in the Dillian White fight, more than what we saw in the Chisora fight, and the Anthony Joshua fight. Joe Joyce systematically broke down one of the best chins in boxing today, one of the best chins in the entire heavyweight division. Joseph Parker might lack dog. He might, but he's got world-class punch resistance, and it took a world-class fighter to finally break him down and knock him out for the very first time of his career. Joe Joyce showed subtle nuances. And you know what he did? He pressured Joseph Parker with his feet. He wore his gas tank down a number of ways. He wasn't just marching forward throwing bolo punches joe joyce kept the pressure on joseph parker by barreling forward but he didn't always shoot the jab he didn't always give joseph parker something to counter i think that might be lost on a lot of people that joe joyce measured the distance first he wasn't just going out there swinging for the fences and imposing his size and power on joseph parker he was a little bit more methodical he would measure the distance before shooting that jab which was a very short jab by the way a jab he kept in joseph parker's face throughout the entirety of this fight and he'd measure the distance before he'd let it go as to not put something out there that joseph parker could capitalize on as to not put something out there that Joseph Parker could counter. It was a short jab. And a short jab is a little harder to counter than a stiff stick, a stiff jab. Was it really a stiff jab or a step jab to where you're getting the whole arm out there and the other guy might be able to see it come and slip it, come over the top with something? It was a really short jab to where Joe's already well within striking distance once he shoots it and it's safe to shoot it. Once he shoots it, he can follow up, bring some other punches over, maybe some body shots, maybe a backhand, a right hand. After the fight, Joe Joyce didn't look to have a scratch on him. Sensational performance from Joe Joyce, the worst I've ever seen. Joseph Parker, Joseph Parker, who only had the occasional burst of aggression. A hook here, right hand there. None of that stopped Joe Joyce from coming forward. None of it. Joe, he did throw a lot of punches in this fight. You know, Joe Joyce really is a strong puncher, but he's not a one-hitter quitter guy. He's a guy who overwhelms you with volume, accumulated damage. You often hear it said that Joe Joyce is very slow, that his punches lack snap and torque. And perhaps they do. I mean, he ain't got a right hand the way that Anthony Joshua's got a right hand or Deontay Wilder's got a right hand. It's not that kind of situation to where the punch comes in hot, comes in hot and fast. What Joe Joyce has, however, he's got a great gas tank, great cardio, and he can throw punches in bunches to where even if they don't come in fast, there is still 275 pounds of juggernaut behind every single one of those shots, every single one of those punches. And maybe you can deal early on in the fight. Maybe the damage hasn't set in, but once it does and this guy starts smoking, he keeps going. He keeps coming after you. He's going to wear you down. And that's what we saw yesterday between Joe Joyce and Joseph Parker. Eventually, he just wore Joseph up which is what I thought would happen. Joseph Parker ain't got enough pop to put a dent in this guy, and he ain't got enough dog in him to fight him off. I feel like he came in with the wrong game plan, employed the wrong strategy, and had a harder night for it. Congratulations to Joe Joyce, who now turns his attention to his world title opportunity, his world title shot. He wants Usyk. Usyk's mandatory by way of the WBO. And I don't know that Joe Joyce will actually get that Usyk fight in spite of being his mandatory because he's not next in the rotation, I don't think. Alexander Usyk's got three alphabet titles that come with three separate mandatories. Joe Joyce is just one among them. Philippe Pergovic is yet another by way of the IBF. And Daniel Dubois would presumably be his mandatory by way of the WBA since he has their secondary title and they're in the midst of a title consolidation process. A fight between them could be ordered. So I don't know that Joe is going to actually get Usyk in the ring. Usyk is on his way out. He said something about wanting three fights before he retires. Obviously, the Tyson Fury undisputed heavyweight title fight. Then perhaps I think he said he wants Deontay Wilder, then maybe a 
homecoming fight, going away fight, a swan song fight in his own neck of the woods, a fight between today's Joe Joyce and today's Oleksandr Usyk is intriguing, though Usyk wouldn't be in unfamiliar territory. He's fought this guy before in a five-round semi-pro contest some years ago. To no one's surprise, he was able to effectively outmaneuver Joe Joyce at every turn. But that wasn't a five-rounder, you understand. That was a semi-pro contest, and Usyk did prove he can outmaneuver Joe Joyce for five rounds, but what about 12? Can he do that for 12 rounds in a championship boxing match, a pro fight? The trial for Joe Joyce is accumulating enough damage to where he can stop Usyk. Because like I told you, Joe Joyce, he really ain't no speedster, you understand, and he's not a one-hitter quitter guy. He doesn't have that kind of snap, that kind of pop, and throws punches with that kind of torque to where he can just get a guy out of there with a single punch, a single shot. Joe Joyce, his knockouts are by way of accumulated damage and volume. But if you can't land on the guy because he's too quick, he's too athletic, too nimble, too fast, if you can't accumulate damage, how are you going to knock him out? It's not like this would be the first time that Usyk fought a guy that's a lot bigger than he is. He's actually fought Joe Joyce before, and Derek Chisora, and Anthony Joshua. He's dealt with a lot of guys, different sizes, different base styles. He's an experienced fighter, and with Joe, he really wouldn't be in unfamiliar territory. The question is, has Joe changed enough to where he can secure the W this time? Because even here today, he's no speedster, whereas Usyk... Not only does Usyk have mobility and hand speed on his side, Side. He also has timing, and he, like Joe Joyce, has a great engine, a great gas tank. It's one of Joe Joyce's finer qualities that he can keep up the tempo, keep up the pace from the opening round to the final round. But so can Usyk. In fact, Usyk has proven to be stronger as a fight progresses. He actually picks up. He picks up the pace as the fight progresses. Joe's jab won him this fight with Joseph Parker, methodical use of it to punish the guy, his orthodox jab. You know Usyk, he's a southpaw. It's a bit harder to land that jab on a southpaw that's faster than you are with faster hands and faster feet. And that's the trial for Joe Joyce. Landing enough punches, accumulating enough damage to get this guy out of there, because if you don't, he might beat you on points for Usyk. For Usyk, the trial is weathering the storm in a 12-rounder as opposed to a 5-rounder like he did before. Because if we don't know nothing else, we know Joe can take a punch and he's not going to stop coming after you. Usyk's not a knockout puncher. He wasn't a knockout puncher at cruiserweight. He's not a knockout puncher now with heavyweight. So the chances of him knocking out Joe... He's not knocking out Joe Joyce. He's not knocking him out. His best bet is to outpoint him, outmaneuver him, outhustle him since he can't out him. It's easier said than done over the course of 12 rounds in a championship boxing match. He might have did it before in a five-rounder. You'd have to do it for 12 this time.